and welcome back to Conrad's Corner. My name is Conrad Wilson. You're listening to KDRT 95.7 FM in Davis. It is an absolute pleasure to be taking the call of William Hollis, a freelance motivational speaker calling from Reading, Pennsylvania this afternoon. William, can you hear me? Yes, I can. How are you? I'm doing well. And you are calling from your hometown in, uh, or your current hometown in Pennsylvania, right? Yes, sir. Okay. I think that's the uh, the farthest we've ever gone with this phone. So congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Make a history, baby. That's pretty cool. Well, it, that seems to be the theme. You've been doing that for quite some time now. Just an incredible story that you have to share with us today. You were a former standout Tuskegee University linebacker and defensive end, and you actually made a bid to play in the NFL, but realized that you were destined to walk another path. So, so tell me about that. In an, in an interview with Visionaries and Entrepreneurs United magazine last month, you said that football saved your life. How so? Um, football saved my life, man, because it gave me an outlet to see the world in a different light. It, it gave me a brotherhood. It gave me a sense of family. Uh, my mother was a, um, a heroin addict. She struggled with, with a heroin addiction half half of, half of my life and mostly, you know, um, uh, half of her life. And um, football will give me escape from um, always worrying about my mother. Since I was a kid, I was always just worried about um, her survival, uh, her health, and everything about her. That was my queen. Like I said, she couldn't give us everything, but she gave me love. And with football, gave me an opportunity to be as a kid. It gave me an opportunity to be um, around uh, positive people and, and uh, father figures uh, that can teach me lessons that I couldn't learn growing up in my neighborhood. It, it, was it the one constant in your life, football? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. It was. It, without football, man, I know for a fact I probably would be in the penitentiary or dead. So you you were almost in the NFL, actually. What happened there? And and tell me about that transition. Um, uh, when I was um at a, I went to Clark Atlanta University. Um, I was a. Uh, Nominated for the D2 Heisman Trophy to Harlan Hill uh, as a junior. I was like the number one black college linebacker. Uh, I got a call from Terry Bowden and some of his people to ask me to come down the road to Florence, Alabama, to North Alabama to play for um, the University of North Alabama. And um, going into the spring, um, uh, I went to give birth to my daughter. The day after my daughter was born, the mother of my child, mother, was paralyzed leaving the hospital, and she had to take in her brother and sister. And I literally... Um, I had to um, basically drop uh, drop out of school to take care of my daughter. It was either football or my um, my daughter. And, you know, um, I grew up without a father figure in my life, and I grew up with a rocky road, and I just didn't ever want to – I never wanted my daughter to experience anything like that. So I um, uh, made a decision to leave school in my prime of my career when I was the number one linebacker coming out of black college in Terry Bowden. Um, and Jeff Bowden and all those guys were going to take me to a whole nother level. I was uh, set to play with Janoris Jenkins, uh, Marcus Dalton. Um, we were going to have a stout defense, and I was a part of that play, and I was the only D2 player that they picked up from another Division II school. And, um, he, and he said, I saw a lot of characteristics in me. With um, uh, As uh, Takeo Spikes, he used to coach uh, Terry Bowden, said, I, p- I played a game 100 miles per hour, man. I, 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 I was – uh, that was my motto, man. Uh, 100, 100 miles per hour, cut the brakes. And, that, and that, that was me, man. 1,000 miles per hour, man. I just <laughs> played the game. I played the game, and like my life depended on it because it did, man. And, and that was the place I called home. But like I said, man, um, it was just, uh, I believe, um, the Lord uh, was taking me in a different direction. And I believe that's what I'm doing now. Now, you, you also played at Tuskegee, correct, where you won uh, a lot of awards. Yes, it was actually... Clark Atlanta, where I won all the awards. Tuskegee okay. is actually where I made, tried to make my comeback after I got enough money up with my family in Boston to leave and go back into school. And when I got into Tuskegee, um, they basically hired a new defensive line coach because they was going to have me play defensive line because it was more of an easier transition because I put on a little bit of weight um, when I was out. And... Um, they basically um, put me to this new defensive line coach, and he, he did a lot of background checks, and he looked up a lot of information on my father and my family and, and the, 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 the crime that they were involved in in um, uh, Pontiac, Michigan. Right. And uh, he just always called me a thug, man. He called me he, – he would call me all types of things. And mind you, man, I came down – I went down to Tuskegee University 
with basically uh, just an opportunity from a coach to coach me at Clark Atlanta University. He said, well, I can't promise you a scholarship, but I can promise you an opportunity. So basically, I man, I went down there with three weeks of clothes uh, in a duffel bag, no money, no food, Facebooked a friend, to see, uh, not a friend, but a person that went to the school, and asked him, could I sleep on his floor um, until I earned the scholarship? Didn't know how I would get it done, but I knew – I had the talent, and I, and I knew I always still had the ability, and I was still young. So I went down there and went through all that to the coach for the coach to say that um, I was a hoodlum, I was a thug, I never amounted mount to anything, and this this coming after um, burying my mother out of all things. So that's, that's unbelievable. How, that's what happened at Tuskegee University. Well, and, and what age were you when your mother passed away? I was twenty years old. Okay, and and you you have a, a you're spearheading a program called "What Does My Mother Mean to Me?" How important was your mom in your life? Uh, my mother was my mother was my heartbeat. My mother was my soul. She was everything that drove me to get up every day and run those miles in the project. She the one that drove me every day to get up and work hard uh, when everybody else was partying. Um, I never saw my mother. Um, happy like she deserved to be. I never saw her pampered like she deserved to be. And my mother um, taught me that um, that life is bigger than yourself. And once you grasp that understanding of life, you will start to you will start to feel um, more riches than money. And that was a little. She played a lot in everything I'm doing to this day. But my mother was a driving force of William Hollis. She was a driving force behind everything I accomplished because I wasn't playing the game for fun. I was playing the game to save lives. And I realized that at a young age that I can save lives. And my number one goal was to save my mother. I wanted to make her happy. I wanted to give her things that she never ever could imagine she had and I sacrificed everything for her. And, and and to break it down and quite frankly that was my world that was my heart man wow wow it's interesting because a lot of folks who aren't into sports especially aren't into football or maybe it's baseball or whatever it may be to hear an interview like this is truly illuminating because this is a sport football that that was so 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 much at the core of your life, so important to you, not just then, but but now. And it's it's amazing that a sport, something that some folks kind of write off as entertainment, exercise, or whatever, that that was your savior. Yes, that's unreal. Okay, so take me back in time, William, to life in Pontiac, Michigan, which is your true hometown. I mean, now you're in Reading, Pennsylvania. Uh, I can imagine things have to be better. Reading about your your, your conditions in, in Pontiac, but uh, it's just unbelievable the the things that you had to endure at such a young age in Michigan. Yeah. Yes, well, um, in Pontiac, um, it was really like um, the my frame in Pontiac is. Basically, we have welfare, so we're not poor. But my mentality, I realized at a very young age that living on welfare, you're still poor because if they were to take it, cut that card off or take all those government assistance checks away, we're starving. So I, I looked at Pontiac, Michigan as a, as a pure trap. It was the best way to describe it is you could put your hand on the ground, you could touch the devil's fingertips. Uh, it, was, it was murderers. It was drug dealers. It was... It was um, the drug addicted mothers. It was mothers that was molested by their fathers. It was it was self medicated people who, that that will go through tragic losses, seeing people get their brains blown out in front of them, and they would just have to live with it. They don't get a psychiatrist. They don't get a, a therapist. They don't get anything like that. They just got to deal with it. And this is when the drugs and the alcohol take place, and they start to self medicate themselves because they're not getting the attention or learning the proper way they're supposed to learn. Me, um, I didn't even know how to read till I was 16 years old. I was reading at a fourth to fifth grade level at 16 years old. It was ridiculous. I, I, only thing I knew, man, was survival. I never knew a childhood. It was, it was all survival. I was listening to people telling me I was going to be this, I was going to be nothing. Um, uh, I learned that the cocky attitude that I obtained was through 
with, like I said, a lot of people look at athletes like they're crazy and they're mean and they and they and they just stuck up and arrogant. But when you grow up with no family supporting you, it's okay if different people, mothers and fathers, say, "Hey, kid, great game." But it's a special feeling when your own family members say the people that you've grown up in a household with say, "Great job, Will," or "Great job, son." It, it's a different feeling. So what happens is when you don't get that, you start to celebrate yourself. You start to talk about yourself. You start to brag about yourself, not because you're cocky. It's because this is what you've been yearning for. So the only, if, if nobody else going to big you up, you start to – so you look at the Terrell Owens, you look at all these type of guys, that's what that comes from. It's just pain covered up by cockiness, and the cockiness is the weakest part of it all. And that's what Pontiac, Michigan made me do. It, it made me be cocky. It made me, it made me just – focus on my mother and not care about anybody else through the process. Pontiac, Michigan, it was, it was basically like a ticking time bomb. And I had to get out of there I had to get out of there before it exploded. Well, and I, I fought my tail off to do that. Well, of course, it, now there's been, uh, you, you've changed tunes. I mean, you're a motivational speaker. You've committed your life to helping others. Yes. How did that happen? Man, honestly, I was, um, I messed up my back. I cracked my vertebrae. Could no longer play football. Um, uh, the team that I had played for um, basically had told me uh, they had promised me a place after the season. They left me um, homeless at the end of the season. I was sneaking in hotel rooms in um, East Windsor, New Jersey, at, at a uh, Holiday Inn. I was sneaking in rooms and also got a job there. But they didn't know I was staying there. It was against the law for me to be working there and staying there. I went down to Dover, Delaware with a friend once they finally caught up with me and found out I was staying there. They put me out. I lost my job. I ended up homeless in Dover, Delaware. Um, and um, basically, I was sleeping on the side of a turkey hill, eating from garbage cans. Uh, I, the, that season before, on Mother's Day, I had 4.5 sacks in one game uh, uh, against a coach named Bernie Nortowski that coached the Harrisburg Stampede, which was owned by Marcus Coastal. Uh, the, uh, former, the former um, uh, player for the uh, New Orleans Saints. Of course. Um, he um, uh, basically um, had the team. I was um, uh, getting ready to – I was going to play. I didn't even tell him about – I didn't say anything about the pains I was feeling in my back or anything like that. And I literally was about to play the season. He put uh, – Coach B had took me – he picked me up from Dover, Delaware, and um, he let me stay in his house. He let me stay in his home for – uh, two months, and then we moved into the um, houses that he had in Hershey, that Marcus Colson had in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Four months in, um, we get a call from the coach, and he say, Will, the team has folded. But uh, literally four weeks before he called me and said the team had folded, I found out about my back. I was in the gym doing explosion workouts. I was on the um, squat rack, and my whole right leg went out on me, and it went numb. And I kept feeling this pain. I kept feeling this pain. So I basically got to the point where – I was hitting things, and I would notice my whole side of my body was going numb. And I kept asking dudes in the training, like, Will, is something wrong? So I never went to see anybody. I just knew my back was ruined. And um, I would go through excruciating pain, no medication. And literally, uh, those couple of weeks later, I got a call because he said, Will, the team has folded. There will not be no stampede. And I say by the grace of God that, I didn't play that season because I would have been a vegetable and I had to play so I could eat and so I could survive and have a place to sleep. And when that happened, um, Coach B said, Will, I know you don't have nowhere to go. Come back down to my place and stay with me. I went down and started coaching for the SI pa Panthers down here in Pennsylvania. only lasted for one year. I was the youngest coach in the league at 25 years old. And they basically um, – we coached, and they had a volunteering thing to go speak at schools for the SI Panthers. I went to the school, asked them, can I volunteer? Um, uh, I had kids in tears within 35 minutes. An hour later, uh, the superintendent of the school district called me and said, well, how much you charge to speak? And literally, man, I walked into my destiny the day I walked in and volunteered at that school. And from that day on, the next week I was doing four assemblies in one day. The following week I was in St. Joseph Hospital speaking to ecology nurses. And then I was in Maine, and that's when I knew I arrived as a speaker. No speaking classes, no nothing. And the only thing I can explain it can explain it by is God, man. It had to be God. He gave me a true gift, man. And I'm, I'm, it, it, every time I would speak, it will heal my soul. I will forgive myself because I always fought. That moment I left to give birth to my daughter, I knew that I lost my mother that day. 
because I, I fought my whole life to save her, and she was getting tired. She was getting weaker. She was calling me, saying I'm hungry. She was calling me, saying I'm cold. There's no heat in the house. And she was getting weak. And when I left, she called me, and she said, I just want you to know that I'm proud of you, no matter what. I'm proud of you. And what happened was, when I went back to California to train to go back to Tuskegee, I get a call that where your mother passed away in the crack house, falling from her eyes and falling from her mouth. And she's gone at 37 years old. And I buried my mama. And my whole dream of saving her life was over with. And I blamed myself. And when I got into speaking, I started to feel my soul heal. I started to, I started to find my true purpose. And I didn't care about the money. I didn't care about um, the celebrity. I didn't care about being having these nicknames. I only cared about pouring, to other pe- pouring into other people. Because it was healing my soul, and it was healing it at a fast rate. Now, every day, man, I'm waking up with closure, and I'm waking up at 26 years old with so much time and so much more life to live. And the beauty, and I tell people, once you learn how to work for your purpose instead of your money, the purpose will start to work for you. And I know for a fact that the Lord leaves your gift at the bottom of the stairs, and it's up to you to climb them to show the world. And that's what I'm doing. And I'm enjoying the journey. Wow. Well, what a journey it's been. Thank you so much for taking time out of your Friday to share it with us. Before I let you go, William, rumor has it you're working on a new book. Tell me more. Um, it's a, um, Basically, man, what it's going to do, it's going to be the blueprint. Because when I was growing up in the, in the neighborhoods I was growing up with, everybody tell you what to do right and wrong, but you have to give them a blueprint. You have to teach them how to live inside their head. You got to teach them to stay involved in every activity, every good thing that's in the neighborhood. And it's basically, um, it's basically going to be um, the. Uh, it's, it's, it's basically going to be called. It's a blue. It's a blueprint. Okay. It's a blueprint to escape poverty and in, in, your, in, in your situation. Um, how to see further than than what you see in front of, and and that's what I want to teach them. I want to teach them what William Hollis did to to um, make it out of there. Any idea when it will arrive at a bookstore near us? Uh, definitely by by uh, next year. By next year, definitely. I want to make it. I'm, I'm taking my time, man, and it's honestly uh, a biggest blessing. Man. I'm a kid that will have this severe learning disability, and I'm writing this whole thing on my own. Um, and um, it's actually, man, it's, it's my goal, man. It's my everything. It's my heartbeat, man. So I'm working on it, man. I'm definitely going to shoot you. You know, as soon as I get ready to drop it, man, you will have a free copy, big guy. And hopefully I come back on and talk about it because it's going to be something special. Well, you've got a date. Why don't we make it happen? <laughs> <laughs> I got you, big guy. Wow. Well, thank it's you. It's a pleasure, man. Thank you. Well, it's, a, it's an absolute, absolute pleasure to have you on the radio program today. And uh, best of luck in your future endeavors, and God bless. Thank you. Okay. Up next on Conrad's Corner, we have uh, not a lot of time, but a little bit just to talk about a few stories. So we're going to take a take a short break, talk about the cyber attack that happened last week where university printers were just suddenly printing anti-Semitic material. Uh, the UC Vet School ranks number one in the world. Some other stories there, maybe some sports news to close us down. My name is Conrad Wilton. This is Conrad's Corner, KDRT. 95.7 FM in Davis. Yeah, you gotta get out.